Um, um, so one thing I want to say, or two things I want to say, one is, um, you know, even three, five years ago, SaaS metrics were not standardized in the industry. Churn to one person means churn to someone else, new expansion. Um, you know, a lot of what Nick's done out of coming out of Zendesk, which is a very metric driven company, despite the fact that it's a very sort of content and product first company as well, has been um, being very specific about the science of acquisition and productivity. And now with Chartmogul has sort of created some standards within the industry, both through the actual product and how we, like we use it ourselves to recognize revenue, as well as um, through the content you've put out that I think is really helping us all. And I think the second thing, even though this was a little higher level than some of the marketing uh, engagement we were showing today with the trial, I think as uh, whether in growth or mar revenue or sales or marketing, I think it's really important to recognize that the engagement we do for onboarding, for uh, enabling new customers, for nurturing your database, for proactively outreaching to potential signals of churn, everything you're doing is directly impacting a retention or, or a conversion of a customer, which is tying to revenue. So I think personally, it's really important for everybody in the space who does kind of what we do, or a lot of people here do, is to think about the revenue impact and actually not just think about it, but be able to measure that straight through and recognize that by automating a lot of these operations, you are directly impacting revenue, which is ultimately what matters most. For example, in our own board meetings, by the way, one interesting point is we capture UTMs built into autopilot so that we can see at every step of the way, as soon as someone's cookied, um, you're capturing every UTM engagement. So whether they've been on AdWords or any place you control the URL, we actually capture that and you can do attribution based on that, which is how we internally do channel attribution for our board meetings. It's also a way you could say, have a specialized campaign for someone who comes to you from AdWords versus from a specific blog. If they come from a chart mogul blog post, we can do a follow-up campaign around that by creating a smart segment with UTM attribution. So anyway, my point being, while Nick just gave us a PhD level in, in, uh, in SaaS metrics, I think everyone is behooved to have at least a bachelor's level degree around what is driving new expansion, interaction, churn, net retention, lifetime value, and being using that language when describing the outputs of what nurturing and what, frankly, marketing through multiple channels will do for you in the organization. It's a, a critical piece to closing that loop to revenue. So without further ado, we're going to shift things up. Uh, we're going to invite JD and Nick and Mike to come up here and do a quick fireside chat. It's now 6.20, so I know we're getting a little bit on. Um, I'm going to be serving up some questions and, um, and also would love to open questions out to the board. It could be uh, to the board, to the entire room. <laughs> it could be um, you know, about what we've talked about today. It could be about anything else. Personally, I'm really excited. Like JD um, has had a tremendous amount of experience at Marketo at Zendesk and here as well as Nick and I think it's a real pleasure to have people here today and uh, wanted to go through some personal elements as well as professional at, at their companies about what's attracted them here and so on. So before we go into questions I just wanted to, because uh, JD you haven't had a chance to speak today which is partially my bad in learning it up. <laughs> no, but, but, um, but JD gave a lot of the presentations at Zen Use, which are a big training and workshops there and is one of the, the big public profiles. So wanted to ask to share a little bit about scripted, what you do, and the importance of content in driving a lot of what we talked about today, I suppose. Yeah, definitely, as I get mic'd up here. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the intro, and, and thanks for everybody for uh, for joining and great presentation uh, by all all you guys uh, leading up to this. Um, I'll give you just a quick little spiel on scripted, but I'll do it in a in a different way. Um, as I'll maybe give a little bit of story that can give you a little insight into my background, maybe the general world of content, and then leading to what scripted does. Um, so a couple companies ago, feels like lifetimes ago, but, uh, but uh, not really that long ago, but a couple companies ago, I worked at Marketo in the early days helping build, actually ran products there helping build um, some of the earliest versions of Marketo, which was kind of one of the pioneers in the marketing automation space that Autopilot and others are, are taking to a new level um, nowadays. And one thing that, was, that I clearly learned at Marketo was that no matter what we built, no matter how great of a marketing automation system we built and gave to these marketers, many of them failed. And the ones that failed is because they struggled with content. Ultimately, content is sort of, if you think of the marketing automation system as the engine, if you will, or the car, it's content that's the gas that ultimately has to fuel that. And if you don't have a, a steady stream of high quality content, 
to actually use when you're nurturing folks and you're reaching out to them and you're driving them to take actions, you're gonna struggle no matter how good the product is. So that was kind of one like early insight that I think all of us at Marketo had and something that definitely stayed with me. Um, then you jump ahead to Zendesk where I go in there and I remember like my first day on the job at Zendesk, um, you know, I walk in the door and it's like, so JD, our engineering team is building an enterprise plan. We're building all these enterprise features. We're going enterprise, yeah. And uh, it was like my first job was figure that out, figure out how to like take that to market, how we should package that, what, what the hell should we do with enterprise? Um, and sort of knowing that you know, enterprise sales cycles are longer, there's just gonna be more things we're gonna have to do to ultimately uh, get engaged with, with enterprise buyers. I said, okay, well, great. Well, what kind of content do we have that we could surface and, and help our salespeople uh, either get in front of those enterprise clients or have on our website or that sort of thing? And we had basically none. We had content even from the early days there. It was something that was, uh, a, the blog was always important to our founders and to our company, but we really didn't have anything you could call like enterprise grade content. And so I said, okay, we gotta build some. So who wants to write an enterprise white paper? You know, it was about this much silence um, uh, in the company. We really didn't have anybody that, 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 that had that skill set to be able to do that. So then it's like, okay, great. Well, what do I do to get one? Well, I don't know. I guess I tap my Rolodex. Do I know anybody? Do I know any freelance writers or anybody doing this? And I, I literally just start talking to people and eventually had somebody in my network say, oh, I got this great guy. I don't remember his name. I want to say it was David. Hopefully he's not sitting here. Um, where, where are the stories about to go? Um, and and you know, so I reach out to this David guy. And long story short, $8,000 later, I got a crappy white paper. Um, and it was a painful process to get to that crappy white paper, uh, even aside from the eight, eight grand. Um, and so it's hard. It's, it's ultimately hard. And at Zendesk, we put a huge focus and a huge amount of energy and resources into content. But it took us a while to really get, um, and we used a lot of in-house resources. We also balanced that with eventually figuring out how to find some good uh, outsourced uh, resources as well and really blended that to ultimately create a pretty good content engine. But that also very much stuck with me of just how hard it is to find people that can write really well and write on these sort of business topics. Um, so that sort of brings me to Scripted and ultimately that's the problem Scripted is solving and what, what drew me there initially was solving that problem of making it a lot easier to create great content for businesses. So in a nutshell, that's what Scripted does. Um, we're the leading marketplace for original content creation. In a nutshell, we have a network of thousands of the best freelance writers and we match them up with businesses who have needs for content marketing. Um, we are a marketplace kind of first and foremost. We're not actually a SaaS company per se, although we're kind of a hybrid in many, many ways. And there's a lot of, I guess, sassy, if, is that a word? Is that now a word sassy. nowadays, sassy? I think sassy. that is an actual word. Um, we have some sassy elements to us. And in fact, more sort of to come as we're starting to move towards more of a subscription model where we can actually bring down the prices of the actual content and get businesses and writers interacting more and kind of do that through an ongoing membership fee is one of the ways we're transitioning. Um, but at the end of the day, we're about helping people find the best writers and helping them create the content they need to fuel their automation, fuel their customer journeys, fuel their website and all that sort of thing. And we do it with some pretty interesting technology. This is not Craigslist. This is not walking in and just seeing a list of writers and picking one. Um, we use technology to vet writers. Only 5% of the writers who actually apply to Scripted can make it through our vetting process, and that's all very technology driven. Uh, then we also use technology to match based on who you are, what kind of business, what kind of content you're looking for, and your guidelines. We have algorithms that match you to the best writers based on what we know about them that are gonna be the best fit for what you do. Um, and then third is we maintain quality through an ongoing quality score algorithm that we've got data scientists that really worked on and looked at all the content we've created for all these different marketing customers out there and really started to hone in on what are the factors that ultimately drive quality and ultimately are the best predictors of whether a writer's going to meet somebody's expectation for quality. And so we, much like Uber has scores for their drivers, that sort of thing, we have a quality score for all of our writers. So when you come in and request stuff, we're, we're kind of getting to the top of the stack when it comes to that. So I won't ramble on about that anymore. Um, we do have some notebooks and things over there and a couple folks from Scripted, wave, wave, your, wave your hand. Uh, if you want to learn more, definitely you can, you can talk to myself or them um, later. But I think ultimately, kind of as I said earlier, um, I'm excited to be working with Autopilot and, and, and privileged to be here, um, as I do think the world of content and the world of marketing automation really go, you know, pick your analogy, bread and butter, peanut butter and jelly, whatever, they, they really go together. And you can't be successful in one without the other.
some of our content is pretty specific in terms of knowledge and domain expertise. Um, but in terms of thinking about using a service like Scripted, which we get asked a lot by customers, obviously, who need to generate more content, um, what kind of companies do you see as being your sweet spot or get the most benefit and value out of doing lots of blog and content creation through Scripted? Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, there's not a specific type of company per se that I think benefits more than others, meaning it, it could be a software company, it can be a retail company, and we see them really spanning the verticals. There are certainly a couple verticals that, that, that seem to do better you know, with us than others, but it really spans the verticals. I think the key thing for us is sort of the stage of the funnel and the type of content that you're going to say. What we're probably not best at is if you want somebody to write a detailed analysis of autopilot features mm -hmm. or of stuff autopilot does, that's probably not what you're coming to scripted for. Um, that's probably what you actually want to use in-house resources for um, and that sort of thing. We could actually help you take you know, notes and information from your subject matter experts and just have a good writer you know, put that into a more articulate story. But most of where I'd, kind of where we specialize would be higher up in the funnel. Um, so more kind of thought leadership pieces, kind of more evergreen trend pieces, uh, blog type content, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, but it does really span the business types. So maybe I'll start with a question for the entire panel. By the way, like questions are open, so if anybody has anything, just raise your hand. Um, as long as they're easy. <laughs> yeah, as long as they're easy, exactly. Softballs. <laughs> um, so at a, at a high level, so there's Box and there's Zendesk right now, are two big public SaaS companies. Box has more revenue, Zendesk is valued higher at a company level. Why, why do you think that is? Why is Box valued lower than Zendesk, despite Zendesk having lower revenue? <laughs> wants to go first on that. Yeah. Maybe I'll start with Nick because you have a pretty good historical perspective um, and you're a revenue. It's uh, kind of pathetic. Over. We have to like pass this around. That's cool. <laughs> Didn't really why think about they, this. <laughs> why are they valued differently? Yeah. I think Box has uh, colossal costs, right? That don't seem to be um, going uh, going away anytime soon, right? Whereas mm -hmm. their cost of acquisition is enormous. Mm -hmm. Zendesk is quite healthy and narrow, I believe, mm -hmm. from memory. But I think it's just a. Yeah. It's just basically the dynamics of the business in that Zendesk doesn't have to spend that much money to grow, whereas Box has to spend a colossal amount of money to grow. And, uh, yeah. I, I, think that's a big, I think that's a big piece of it. Um, I think was that, just going back to like SaaS you know, metrics and that sort of thing, I think some of the underlying economics of the Zendesk business are frankly a little better, um, as he pointed out. Um, I think I think personally I think there's a I don't I don't know if this actually translated into valuation but when I look at the at the two companies I definitely feel like Box is a little more on the commoditized end of things um, and I, and I think Zendesk is really um, while there's certainly other people that do customer service software um, I think that they you know the customer experience that they've created kind of all around that the um, yeah I think those types of things seem to push them to a, a I don't know, a different level of perception, I guess, of what the company is and what it can be going forward. I don't know if that's a good answer. But. I, heard, I heard something from a, I was talking to one VC the other day at Saster, and he said that uh, the, 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 their thinking was that in the public markets, if you sell more to SMBs, you're going to fare well uh, in an uncertain economy like we're in right now. So Tableau, which sells quite an expensive enterprise type products, like completely slashed its valuation, whereas if you're selling into SMBs, it's kind of more stable in uh, bad times because people aren't going to spend millions, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on enterprise software when uh, there's uncertainty. Something like that. I think both these companies are pretty much all the companies lost about half their valuation in the last month, though, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a. I I think that um, it's an interesting point um, in that. You know, Box is susceptible to lunchbox files and various other competitors. Um, but the the thing that I always pitch investors on with what we do is really this axis of companies that I believe in and invest on the public market in it between accessibility and affordability. And I don't just mean uh, accessible as in um, it's an accessible product, but there's definitely a distinguishment in the market now between you know I signed up to Chart Mogul, I see immediate value. Uh, I, I tell everyone I talk to, in fact, everyone in this room, if you, like, I, this isn't even a pitch, just use it. If you're going to talk to investors, you need this product. Uh, and I think Zendesk is one of those products to the SMB where it's accessible, affordable, everyone can get access, 
to it, whether you're a one person startup or you're an enterprise. Box is this like disgusting thing, whereas Dropbox <laughs> is this civil, beautiful solution that you tell your friends about, whereas Box, you're just like, Aaron Levy's a really funny dude on Twitter, but he has a shit product, and that's gonna be really hard to sell, so it's gonna cost a lot of money. And Zendesk is a nice, beautiful product that I tell my friends about, so that's probably gonna fare better. And that's sort of my, how I invest publicly strategy, is like, is this a shitty thing? And um, so the accessible affordability access, I think there's a new generation of companies like yours, like Scripted, hopefully like us, where you know, you're breaking down all those barriers. And our, I don't know if I should even say this, but our designer always jokes. He's like, it's like an ATM machine, Mike. Like we just put it online and you know, we're just drawing <laughs> cash from this thing because people just come in and, and do their own thing. And it's amazing the online business, how many, so many people just sign up put a credit card in, start creating journeys, and then they'll upgrade, 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 and it's just this machine that keeps running. And I think Box just, their machines rely on humans and humans don't scale very well. Yeah, and I think those two answers, you ultimately are actually one and the same. I think what Nick had described about the economics is a direct result of that. I can tell you at the time that I left Zendesk, which was post IPO, so really running through kind of our early days up through IPO, 70% of the qualified leads we had came through unpaid organic means and the bulk of those coming from what we would believe would be the word of mouth that you're describing people telling other people people sharing our content or sharing information about Zendesk with their others so you know we had just such this momentum and this wave of people coming to us because of that experience and because of telling their other people which ultimately drives your customer acquisition costs down and gets you the better metrics you know that Nick walked about talked about yeah you don't need that. Good. You don't need that. Well, that was a, that's that a, was a, that's a question. That's a good, oh, question. Yeah. I have a question for JD. So you mentioned um, the quality score with mm -hmm. the content and mining like the data for script scripted to discover what that is. What, um, what from the data? What did you find? What were the components of quality content? Can you repeat the question for that? Yeah, yeah. I'll repeat the part. question. I think the question was uh, referencing back to my statement of uh, using some data science to really figure out what were the kind of key aspects of content that ultimately speak to whether that's going to be a quality piece. And we broke that really down into sort of four different buckets. Um, one we call wordsmith, which is really the sort of, um, and I probably won't describe it, I'll probably get slapped later by our, our data science team, or whatever, but it's really like vocabulary and the types of um, sentence structures and things of that nature. Uh, second is creativity. So are they using uh, unique phrasing? Are they uh, doing things kind of out of the norm? Is there a creative element being brought to this? Um, let's see, now I'm going to get totally tripped up, but it's wordsmithing, creativity, um, research, research. How good a researcher is the, oh, the person writing this? How much research, how much uh, external information are they bringing into a particular piece? Um, and then fourth, help me out, help me out. I know, I'm totally, I'm totally blanking too, and I should know this stuff cold. Um, the research, research words with uh, creativity, and uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm forgetting it, but, but there's a fourth component like that. But, um, Those three are great. Yeah, yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully I answered a little bit there. So I have a question. Um, so, JD, you mentioned something interesting earlier, which was in your Marketo days. You noticed there was a lot of a failure of companies to really implement and be successful using automation. And sort of one thing we, we, we think a lot about really trying to hone in around is this concept of the customer journey yeah. and thinking through the customer journey. And I would even go so far as to say you can kind of tell companies that are really focused on that customer experience from, from finish or in various phases. Um, I'm curious as each, everybody on the panel are either founders or, or thinking through you know, the customer journey, like what, what level of thinking do you do internally um, in terms of how your customers are engaging your product or your company and then um, moving through the life cycle with you? Or, or is that like a key area that you think about, I suppose, right? Is another, is another thing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, we definitely think about it, think about it a lot. And I think we're trying, we try to, you know, um, I think first and foremost, all this stuff and whether it's creating content or creating journeys and all that, it all sort of starts in the foundation of really knowing your customer um, and understanding who they are and what they care about, what's important to them. Um, it, it's understanding, and then it's sort of understanding, as you guys did a good job of pointing out in the trial experience, kind of mapping that to what's, what are the signals that they're gonna that are gonna lead to the right action you guys want as a business? Like, what are the signals within their product usage, within their trial, that are ultimately buying signals, right? And it's sort of the marrying of those two. I think is is 
is what's key to figuring out what is the appropriate journey. It's understanding them and what they want, what they're thinking about, what are their pain points, and trying to be there to address those. And it's kind of mapping those and helping guide them, not push them, but really guide them and be there uh, you know, to help sort of highlight the actions and the interactions that you want them to have with your product. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but, yeah. but that's, that's kind of some of the main stuff I think about. Um, do you I don't know, I read, I read a recent, I read a book that I was, uh, was given at a, a conference last year that was really uh, interesting by Kathy Sierra. It's called Making Users Badass. It was kind of talking about the concept of designing uh, the experience or the product for your customer's customer. So um, for autopilot, you, would, you wouldn't design it for the person that would be configuring this uh, experience, but you design it for the end user who's going to get those emails. Or for us, it would be not designing it for the analyst who's going to use our product, but for the investor who's going to receive the report, or something like that, and kind of designing it one step ahead. And, and then it kind of makes them look good. Or if you're, if you're selling an SLR, you know, like a high-end camera or any kind of camera, instead of designing the camera for the photographer, you're designing it for the person who's going to be viewing the photo album with you, and there was, and, and she she had a bunch of different ways you can do that. I thought that was nice. So we haven't got good enough yet at actually doing that at Charmogo, but it's something we're going to explore. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I like that. I mean, we the one of the things we think about a lot, um, which would nowhere near even close to, but is thinking about you know looking at how people deliver messages over time and what frustrates people and what messages people respond really well to and when we say messages we think about everything even physical things in the mail and um, it, what interests me about that is like the experience we're delivering through our sort of onboarding journey is okay today it can be much better um, but I always try and put myself in the shoes of the person going through it and um, I watch a lot of user testing videos in, in fact um, it, it's ruining my relationship right now. I'm so obsessed with um, <laughs> user testing videos. But you watch them and uh, hearing people's reactions is always interesting to me uh, throughout that process. And then the second piece, I really love this comment, is actually looking at the results and the, the way people are using the product to see if are we doing a good enough job of coaching them how to use it. And back to your point, like a lot of people, you know, they, if their content sucks, it, it's really hard to sort of nudge them in the right direction in, in terms of how to improve. So. It's definitely something we think about obsessively and you know it took me a while to realize to like constantly obsess over that and make it a part of my weekly habit and I used to go through phases of doing it but I try and schedule time each week now to like really hone in and, and think that through. I think one last thing too that, that comes to mind and, and I know we keep referencing Zendesk because we're sort of biased from being from there but uh, I think something they did a good job at and it speaks to me is like your messaging, your content, there's always like two components to it. There's sort of the logic side and of getting across the business points and the purpose of, of, you know, you need to do this or did you do this or, you know, that sort of thing. But you've got to have that emotional component as well. The best people really that are really acing this stuff and succeeding with it have that right marriage of kind of the, the data or the logic side, but also building that emotional connection. Uh, with their users and with the it's a human a, a, at the end of the day that you're trying to communicate to and message with and i think you've got to keep that in mind as you do this too keep it conversational um you know have your tone your brand your images be something that people can have that emotional connection with in addition to just the the, the raw information you want to get across to them god this is some questions yeah Um, so we, one of the things we look at uh, very heavily is um, a lot of usage metrics. Um, so things like, uh, you know, not only the analytics of what they're getting back, but how many messages they're sending, uh, changes in usage, things like that. 
one of the ways we can do it if this, uh, you know, our product starts at $5 a month, so it's really hard to scale success at $5 a month. You can't like call people and help them at $5 a month. But as they start to uh, scale or they're a little bit larger, we have a cutoff point where we, if, if we detect that you're showing signs of churn and we're working towards this all the time based on your usage dropping or bad results, um, or you're not creating more journeys, that's always a good sign for us. Or you're not using more of the complex shapes in a journey, so you're not really getting depth or, or value. Um, then we will change the journey to either try and assist you with great content. One of the things that Guy and his team did, which is really great, is build this thing called Flight School, which has like high level content about just how to be a better marketer and how to think through journey marketing as a whole. And so we'll, we'll push that kind of content to them and, and we'll go as far as, um, you know, calling them and just saying, hey, it looks like you're struggling a little bit here. Can we help? Um, and a lot of that's actually self-scheduled. So we'll send them um, from Hadley uh, somewhere out there who everyone probably knows. So Hadley, um, Hadley will reach out um, automatically to people who are struggling and uh, offer to schedule the time to help them. That works tremendously well. But we're, we're kind of honing that stuff as well uh, all the time for sure. I mean, I think you nailed it. I, I think it's education, ultimately. I think you're right. Like, there are people out there who don't know what they're doing, and there's nothing you can magically create in your software that necessarily is going to fix that on its own. And it's just like my Marketo example, right? People get this, you know, great system or whatever, and they don't know what the hell to do with it, or they don't have the content to fuel it. Um, and I think that's why a lot of the companies mentioned today, HubSpot, Zendesk, like, what do a lot of them have in common is they educated the market. Like in addition to just having the great software and grading the product, I think those companies realize they need to actually be teachers and they need to provide helpful information and, and educate the market on how to do this stuff and do it well. Um, and, that, and I think too many companies make the mistake of only educating on their specific product. But I think the, the, the best companies and the leading companies when it comes to this stuff are, are also creating content that's just educating people sort of more in general about the roles and the job, certainly stuff that's related you know, as closely as possible to what you do as your business. But I think educating the market and teaching them how to be better and how to make the most of this is an important thing you got to think about. But I, I think you should always try and uh, allow, make your product in a way that they can always get some decent value even if they're incompetent. Yeah. Like it should, be, <laughs> it should be easy enough. Like I'm a lousy photographer, I don't know much about but I know I can pick up any, like, I could pick up any, like, $10,000 high-end DSLR camera in the world and instantly, within a few seconds, be able to figure out how to take a photo. And it would probably look pretty nice because they all can have, like, this auto thing. So it's like this, like, green auto thing. You kind of flick it along. You turn it on. You point it. As long as the lens cap's not on, it's going to look okay, <laughs> right? Like, there's, like, a hundred other things on that dial, like the P, like, for, you know, the M, and, this, and it gets common, and it's, like, <laughs> aperture, and all this. I don't really know how that works, but within a few seconds, I know any camera in the world I can take a nice photo, and then they have the instruction manual, they have all the other stuff. If I really get into it, I can probably go on, like, YouTube, and they'll be... You know, that. Nick, I've never used any... I, I have a really good Canon camera. I've never actually taken off the auto setting, so you have a point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, like, with Charming, we, tr you know, you gotta, we, we got to try and make it so that even if people are really not um, good analysts, they get useful analytics out of the product from the first few minutes they use it, but then if they want to invest the time, we're there to help, and there's content there to help them uh, upgrade, or not, up, not upgrade their account, but upgrade their learning and their, their ability, so... That's a good point. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your time, guys. I was wondering, um, we talked a lot about SaaS in general, but high-end enterprise SaaS, you know, big uh, deal values, uh, lots of decision makers, um, the user's not the one party with the credit card. Do you guys have any advice for, uh, you know, automating that process, any thought leaders in that space and, and kind of uh, take away for us? So I'm just going to repeat the question yeah. because uh, it's not coming across the video. So the question is, uh, how do we have any advice around engaging and automating the sales process for high-end enterprise deals? So I think, um, I think from the marketing side of that equation, there's a big rising movement around this concept of account-based marketing or ABM. And I would say definitely there's some great sources of information. I mean, frankly, just go Google that or, or, or look around and there's some great sources and kind of 
emerging resources around that, which is really the, frankly, it's the idea of doing a lot of what we talked about here, but at a company level or in an account-based level. So it's sort of understanding who all the players are and mapping that out and then creating essentially customer journeys and that type of thing, um, but specific for that, that account, personalized down to that account level, um, which can work when you have a limited set of big guys you're sort of going after versus SMB. You can only personalize so far because you've got such a wide you know, audience to go after. Um, so, so I'd say that, that's one definitely like good place to start with there. Um, and then, I mean, I, I, you know, in a nutshell, it, uh, you know, it comes down to a lot of the same principles, I think, that, uh, that we have here or that I think any marketing really relies on. It's knowing and understanding who those customers are and really building out the, I loved seeing the buyer personas earlier. I'm a big believer in that. And I think mapping out and understanding those enterprise buyer personas and what their pains are and then create content uh, and information that maps to those pain points and understand that. Um, and then target as efficiently as you can. Figure out who those companies are that, that you can go after. Um, you know, build out your, your targets, get in front of them with whatever different marketing tactics you can. And then once you've captured them into the funnel, it's about nurturing them all the way through. Um, so I think a lot of the fundamentals are the same. It's just uh, you know, a few of the tactics and maybe the amount of effort you have to put into each company is different. But I don't know if you guys have anything else. Um. <laughs> I, 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 I wrote a blog post last, uh, last week about <laughs> called Nine Tips for Nurturing uh, When You Don't Have a Fully Baked Sales Process. And one thing we see a lot of is companies where there's an enterprise business unit or an enterprise sales force that are trying to expand more aggressively from being a core SaaS business, more SMB, into mid-market enterprise. And a lot of it comes down to, um, one, having clear buyer personas mapped out content mapped out to the stages, recognizing that sales cycles are like six to 18 months versus 30 days. Um, just like JD said, it's like a transposition of the same sort of approaches over a longer time period, having a good relationship between your CRM so you can pass data back and forth between your CRM and the, uh, and the actual automation going out to them. And then also being able to give more control to reps to be able to manage if they're in an active buying cycle versus a life cycle stage as well. Um, and then be able to build out content that maps to each of those different stages as well. The other thing I would just add, and I know from both Zendesk and Marketo experience and me, is just do whatever it takes by any means necessary to get those first few enterprise customers up and running and successful. Um, lighthouse customers, or there's lots of different sort of cliche terms for it. but that you've got to have those proof points to be able to then go wider and get others. Um, I think at Zendesk we're very fortunate to, and this is sort of in a way another tactic people use is, is, is hitching your wagon to companies that are SMBs but are on a great growth trajectory because they grow up to be enterprise customers. And I think Zendesk Groupon was always like the big, the big story is like we started with Groupon when they were a few guys in an apartment. And I think by the time I left Zendesk we had, I don't know, 8,000 support agents at Groupon on Zendesk or something crazy like that. Um, and then that allowed us to, to, we grew with them, we learned what it takes to stay with them and, and not ever have them leave, be able to keep building and morphing our product to meet their needs as they grew. And then that certainly enabled us to then go to the next company that has 8,000 support reps and say, we're doing it already and we're doing it well. True. And, and then what was the question again? Yeah, so, so the question is, um, particularly as you're starting out and it's a SaaS model that maybe is from middling disrupted to extremely disrupted to an existing way of doing things. And, um, and, and you want to start out and you want to engage, but you also want to avoid overdoing it um, and get the right cadence. You know, how, what, what have you seen to help sort of get that right fulcrum point of just enough, not too much, 
you guys want to speak to that? Um, yeah, I can. Um, so I think it's really easy when you have a 30 day trial, for example, to get a cadence going of uh, under communicate versus over communicate. But if you don't have, if I mentioned freemium, that's an interesting example. You're trying to look for either event based or maybe time based based on what you're seeing. I think that ultimately, like as marketers, we always talk about this stuff like, you, you kind of get up in the ivory tower and you're like, we're going to send six emails a week or some bullshit. You really get corrupt in the head. <laughs> and what I always try to do is call, call bullshit on everything we're doing. And sort of, you know, I'll, I literally sign up for new trials of autopilot like every week just to get the emails and go through the experience again. And so I think, you know, we all have natural intuition in this room of what we would like as a consumer or a business consumer. And so I try and um, really put myself in the shoes, just like you mentioned the, the, the enterprise example there. But the cadence is an interesting one. I really think it's so dependent on B2B, B2C. Um, B2C is really easy because you, you know, if it's like a social site or, or commerce, you send things related to products and you, you try and show them products that they might buy next or, or help them in that way. B2B is a little bit harder because, you know, if it's a weekend, they don't really care about you anymore. So you've got to be careful when you communicate. But um, yeah, I think it's just back to what JD said earlier, like studying the hell out of your audience and then putting yourself through that experience. And if you think it sucks, it probably does. Um, and then the metrics are going to really help as well. Yeah, I usually trust my vendors, but I'm not sure I'm going to anymore. Yeah, no, uh, whoops. No, uh, <laughs> no, no but, but in all seriousness, I think, I think one place to always start is just use industry benchmarks or information you can find from other people. So then, I mean, in all seriousness, vendors like this, and you saw earlier their kind of cadence for a trial, start with that. Like, there's a reason they're doing it. Like, they've probably learned and something that's led them to, to, to come up with that. So I think it's just a raw starting point if you're just starting this sort of thing. Um, look to people in the industry who have experience, who have done this sort of thing before. Start with that, and then it's what he said at the end. And then it's pay attention to what you, are your are your users throwing up at that? Are they unsubscribing on email seven yeah. that you sent them in 24 hours? Then probably don't do that, right? I mean, so it's really then starting to hone in and look at the data. Of how yeah, it's unsubscribe performing. is really like Marcus churn rate. Like that, yeah, yeah. that's what you're looking at. Like is that, totally. you know, there's acceptable limits around unsubscribe. But I, I always have removed those unsubscribe links because otherwise people will think it's like a marketing automated email. So. Yeah, well, you might be breaching a lot of there laws. There you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or just do that. Yeah. yeah. It's only like three or four emails. Yeah. Okay. That's so, good. Sometimes uh, in the past. <laughs> Aren't you based in Berlin? <laughs> it's all fine. Sometimes the user will tell you if you're over communicating right. as well. That yeah. happens. Totally. Yeah. And then you just kind of peg it down. They will never tell you you're under communicating. Yeah. I think the, the failure we all slip into is under communicating. Totally. I was Definitely. Just say that. Like that is the bigger problem. Yep. We've done research around companies that communicate more frequently, get 2x the leads, 2x the revenue. There's like we have a report on it where we surveyed hundreds of customers and it's just that people forget to communicate and, and tell interesting things that you may see as day to day things. But um, but to them, it's really interesting. So. Um, having a regular cadence around communication is really important. Like early on in the, the life of our company, we would build like features for customers or we would like tweak things and um, we just wouldn't tell anyone. We were just like, oh, that's cool. Like someone will notice it. And then Guy and his team would turn these into huge product launches, which I would never think is, is sort of maybe worthy of like such a big fanfare. But then the media picks it up, people start blogging about it and it, it blows out of proportion. So I think over communicating is never a bad thing. I, I couldn't agree more with that, but I, I would say chances are all of you are under communicating, not over communicating on that, just, just from my own experience. Um, so, so yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I think that, I think one thing to keep in mind too is, is what you're sending helpful? If it is, you're probably, nobody's gonna have a problem with it. Yeah. Like if you're sending crap and you're just sending to send, like, oh, it's day four, I gotta send yeah. something, and you're just cranking crap out, people are gonna get angry, they're gonna unsubscribe, they're gonna take away, but you know, send me something relevant, something timely, something helpful that's actually gonna help me do better at my job or learn something more about your product. Send those all day, if they're good and they're relevant. I mean, to sort of support that, a couple data points, uh, going to what Mike mentioned earlier, we did a SurveyMonkey, by the way, the SurveyMonkey audiences product is a great way to do sort of large amounts of uh, consumer research. 
for like a tenth the cost of what you traditionally pay a dimensions data or someone like that to do research with. You can get like a thousand consumers who spend more than two hours a day on the internet and ask questions. And one thing we learned is last year is that 65% of companies when we spend sort of American marketers felt like they could be doing a better job of staying in touch with customers, like overwhelmingly the majority. And the second thing was we asked you know, a series of questions and how many leads do you generate monthly and what's the size of your database and sort of normalize that. And basically learned that companies who are staying in touch with customers at least every two to four weeks um, generate on average 2x the leads of those who do every four to 12 weeks or less frequently. So basically what the data would support is for the most part, you're probably not in touch with customers as frequently as you should be or could be. And then to, to JD's point, which is a really important one, it's as Mike mentioned why we went to some efforts around building flight school and we do a lot, is understanding what the needs are and then speaking to those needs and then solving with specific tactical outcomes that can benefit them on a day-to-day -day basis. Sharing that right content, as long as you're adding value there, we say add value with every exchange, um, then, uh, then you know, basically by virtue of just putting in place some system of staying in touch, you're only going to move results up, basically. And somewhat turning this into a shameless plug, um, same thing exists outside of email as well. I mean, same thing with blogging. Um, how many of you have like a company blog? How many of you blog, how many of your, whether it's you, when I say you, I mean your company, uh, blog only once a week or less? A few hands, twice a week, three times, more than, more, four or more? So HubSpot has put out a date, big stat on this many times over, and we've seen the exact same thing in, in data with our customers. Companies who blog at least four times a week get three and a half times more traffic than those that do three times. Like that it, it is sort of a magic number at four per week. So same sort of thing. Like I think people are like, well, we don't have enough to say, and I don't, we don't want to keep blogging all the time like that, but the data shows like the more you do, you're going to get good results. So come to Scripted, and we'll help you blog now. <laughs> Cool. Well, we're coming up to seven o'clock, so it's definitely a little later than uh, than expected. But I think um, it's going really well. So I think at this point we're probably good to maybe take one more question or break into little, you know, go grab some drinks and drinks, continue drinks. There's the a conversation. Bar. There's offline. a bar. <laughs> There's a bar. All right. Well, listen. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Mike for a great demo. JD for um, everything you've shared today about SaaS, and Nick for bringing us Chart Mobile. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Cool. I love the fire. <laughs> yeah, it was funny.